broadcast. Hello, we are broadcasting from Zurich today. Uh, Brother Howard and myself, as well as Andrew and Judah and Ben, have been filming around Europe, especially the places of early Reformation. So we thought we would have a discussion today. We don't have the whole band with us, but we thought we'd have a discussion today that focuses on Reformation, the difference between the magisterial reformers and the radical reformers. So before we get to that, though, we got three songs from New Zealand, and we're going to go ahead and cue those up now. And after that, everything we say will sound better. So <laughs> stick around and uh, enjoy what they sent us from Amen. down under.
some problems on the mountain. All alone he stood against 400 prophets of Baal. He said, let the true God answer by the fire upon the altar. When he prayed, the fire came down. You can hear it lie to you. Yeah. Oh, I let him turn to God. But it was able to deliver. I let him turn to God. Yes, the 
Well, we sure we miss sure y'all. Yes. The Titleys and the Wheelers have been out of town for plenty long, and uh, we miss you. And I miss home as well. I'm going to give a shout out to my kiddos. Your daddy loves you. I know they're watching. And uh, it's good to be here with Brother Howard. And we've been talking about the Reformation and spending a lot of time. So we started in uh, we started in um, Prague, I guess, at Jan Hus's yes. the church where Jan Hus made his stand. And then we went and and. Uh, visited the village where Peter Helchitsky is from yes. and and then we've been in Zurich for several days now and we're going to travel by train to Lyon tomorrow and uh, it's an exciting it's exciting to be in these places and be at the home of Peter of uh, Conrad Grable and, oh, and yeah. the Grossminster Church and so on and so forth so I said at the beginning that the Reformation can be broadly categorized into two groups what is called the magisterial reformers and the radical reformers and the magisterial reformers speaks of those who tried to reform the church by working in submission and in concert with the state with the magistrates and the radical reformers are those <coughs> who in essence were trying to undo the Constantinian synthesis the marriage between the church and the state. And so I thought maybe we could just start in um, what one of the most one of the most troubling things when you look at the Reformation is the brutality of Christians toward Christians. You just cannot fathom and we're going to talk about some of it in detail today, but it's it's hard for us to get our minds around how were they able to devise such tortures and perpetrate such crimes because someone wanted to be baptized differently. And it, it's something that really befuddles the mind, especially our Western mind today. How, how was this possible? And I think that that points us back toward the Constantinian synthesis. Amen. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about what was happening at that time, what the, the synthesis was about, what led up to it, and anything else. Amen. Well. You know, uh, as you even read me a quote before the, the show began uh, by Rodney Clapp that he indicated the Constantinian synthesis really began 200 years before Constantine. I agree with that because something had to be changing in a Christian's mindset to even prepare him to be confused enough to accept the Emperor Constantine who boiled his wife to death, killed his son, chopped the head off of his chief imperial rival, put it on a stake and paraded it around Rome. Uh, for them to associate that with a Christian rule, something had to already be going wrong. And uh, I believe that, uh, and I, I believe history points out, that something began to, to happen in the 100s and was well underway in the 200s in a certain element of the church where God became a item of philosophical speculation. People were no longer, these intellectuals that were coming into the church were no longer really experiencing God but instead they began to theorize and speculate about God and how to combine him with uh, Hellenistic uh, philosophy and such. And so something happened. Um, all of a sudden, Jesus was no longer the exact representation of the Father. He was no longer the... Uh, declaration of the very nature and personality of the Father, but instead it started out with two beings, then it became three, and it left a vacuum where, at least initially, it was the Father could be viewed in a way very different than Jesus. Uh, you could grow, you could have very warm feelings towards Jesus, 
but this father that was distant, you weren't sure, it left a vacuum. It gave an opportunity for people to associate a different type of authority than the authority of love and truth. It gave an opportunity for them to associate a certain degree of wrath and judgment and, and such within God to where then the way they would model earthly rule, it gave room to something like, uh, like a Constantine, a Theodosius, and everything that came after. Because Constantine may have been the beginning, but he certainly was not uh, the pinnacle. Mm. It, uh, it, it went on for, uh, really, until the Radical Reformation. Mm. That's when the church began, uh, began to break. But, but uh, with this confusion, with this vacuum, I will say, mm. of an understanding of the fatherhood of God, that Jesus was the declaration of the fatherhood of God. When that got removed, a different notion of the Father came into, into being. And, uh, and so it left room for, for instance, when, when Eusebius of Caesarea, who was really a, uh, uh, someone trying to write the obituary of Constantine in the most favorable possible light, uh, wrote that when he went into the, the imperial palace, when Constantine had invited the bishops to his great palace, uh, he said, behold, it was as a dream we were seeing the coming of Christ and his kingdom. They actually... Visiting Constantine. Exactly. He felt like was... With all the soldiers. He describes the, the ante rooms, the soldiers with their plumed... Uh, helmets and, and their shields and such and the opulence of the royal palaces which we joined up uh, and were able to go to Prague we, we joined up on the good side of all this <laughs> I have spent uh, the previous uh, let's see probably seven days um, running down the imperial church mm. and the the opulence mm. the gaudiness mm. uh, it's like the bride of Christ put on mascara and lipstick and a seductive dress mm. <laughs> and mm. and uh, it, it's it's phenomenal yeah this is the Hercules room uh, is this uh, at the Vatican th no no this actually is the, the Sun, Sun King's uh, oh, yeah. palace Louis the 13th 14th 14th Versailles and, and the 15th and and uh, the the go, the gilded the simplicity of Christ is completely missing um, the so much was represented in it a confusion of, of uh, Greek philosophy uh, this is this is a, a pulpit uh, in Trier uh, uh, Trier is was actually founded by Con the cathedral there was founded by Constantine and uh, one of the things I was after was to be able to see St. Helena's skull. Um, that was a that's, notable prize. Yes, that was. That was wonderful. Relics had come into the church. That's St. Helena. Inside that box is her skull. <laughs> they, uh, they sought the living amongst the dead. Yeah. They started to worship uh, dead saints and, and so, thought that they were a source of miracles. So here we are. We're going to we're going to look at the Reformation starting with the morning star of the Reformation in the late 1300s and 1400s. Yes. But you're saying we really have to go a thousand years before, 1100 years before. Yes. And we have to see what happened at the Constantinian synthesis. That's what gave birth <clears throat> to the mindset that could allow not the Reformation but the persecution yes. within the Reformation. Yes. And you're saying that the Neoplatonism that was in the church from the 200s replaced an experience with God Absolutely. with philosophical ab absolutes and speculation and theories about God. And, and, and fundamentally, the, their view, the Cappadocian view of the Trinity, uh, amounted to the fact that people could tolerate a disparity within the Godhead, where they could tolerate a notion of God that envisioned a compassionate son and an angry father. And, and a compassionate mother. 
<laughs> because during all of this, of course, Mariolatry really came to the forefront. As a matter of fact, many of the early church councils, ecumenical councils, were actually dedicated to Mary, not to God. But so yes, they were looking for some <laughs> sympathetic feelings. Sure. As a matter of fact, a lot of the the uh, icons that you see really don't evoke a sense of sympathy for Jesus. It evokes a sense of sympathy for the mother who lost her son. Right. It's it's really a it's a, a perversion. It is very much so. You know, John one says John one eighteen. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Amen. Son of God, in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. Amen. He has brought Him forth and made Him seen. Or Paul says He is the image of the invisible God. Absolutely. The firstborn of all creation. Writer of Hebrews says He is the exact representation of God's nature. Amen. And and so all of these scriptures show Jesus tells Philip, When you've seen me, you have seen, seen the, the Father. Father. But the Cappadocian view of, of the Trinity, of the Godhead, basically created a system where people said, Okay, we see who God the Son is, but we don't see God the Father. He's impassable, he's unknowable, That's right. he can't relate to us. And you're saying that that allowed a notion to develop within the church where they saw within the Godhead both mercy of the Lamb and wrath of the Father. And that translated into the church trying to be a compassionate agency, but the Christian kings or emperors showing the wrath of the Father. Yes. That's a powerful motif Amen. that not it, very it, many people allow, talk about. It, it would, we can at least say this with, with confidence. The Constantinian synthesis would have been impossible were it not for the development of a division of personalities within the Godhead. Amen. So, in short, the Constantinian synthesis, when Constantine came to power, some good things happened. Christians were no longer persecuted. Uh, the religion was legalized. Lands and, and properties were restored. But something else was happening, and that was that the church which had persecuted, the, the state which had persecuted the church for over 300 years is now going to marry the church and make the church's mission its supposed mission. Mm -hmm. And you said that Eusebius is the historian that paints the view of the church at that time. And so everybody after him views history through the lens, through poor Eusebius' lens, uh, obsequious Eusebius, who flattered and 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 gilded the whole drama yes. in a very favorable light. I think of the the we while we've been here in in uh, Zurich, we were able to speak with three fairly knowledgeable, renowned scholars, and even the pastor, scholar, uh, theologian yeah, of the head of the Church. theological department. Yes, yeah. and uh, all of them emphasized. Uh, you know, just they just volunteered it in defense of the reformers that persecuted the Anabaptists. That we had to understand that the world view of the church in the 14 and 1500s was such, it was impossible to see anything outside of the Constantinian synthesis, the marriage of church and state. They absolutely, it was the world view. It, it became uh, the model of the church, and anything that was aberrant from that, that was heresy, that was crazy. So when is the first time that violence from Christians against Christians is really sanctioned and rationalized? Is it Augustine of Hippo? Augustine, he, uh, he certainly... Uh, gave the 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 formula for it the the uh, uh, the outline of how he he came up with just war so, oh there he is okay handsome fellow <laughs> and, and uh, he got so upset and of course he was a neoplatonist philosopher uh, he he uh, uh, he 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 was converted uh, by the preaching of Ambrose in Milan uh, when he was speaking about Neoplatonism. Ambrose was. Ambrose, yeah. And, 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 uh, uh, but Augustine became a very zealous Orthodox uh, minister and he tried to uh, persuade the Donatists, 
Donatists were, they had their problems. But he began, began to be so frustrated with uh, his inability to persuade them with words that he finally was converted to the fact that the emperor can help out here. Mm. And so he basically sicked the Roman Empire on it, on the, on the Donatists. And then he had to justify it, he had to rationalize it. And he came up with a just war theory. He, uh, uh, he, he said that the, the state should be used to prosecute heresy and such like that. And almost all, Martin Luther, uh, the magisterial reformers were consciously Augustinian. It's interesting, some of the historians we've spoken to here in Zurich said that the Catholics were staunch Augustinians yes. and the Reformers were staunch Augustinians while they were killing each other. That's it. So he's considered the most influential theologian in Absolutely. church history. Absolutely. Uh, too bad it's not Jesus and Paul. But, Amen. Um, so he rationalized basically when he lost the argument or when he wasn't able to trounce his enemy intellectually, he appealed to the state to to use the arm of the state against yes. Christians. Yes. Um, and, and you were saying the other day that he said something along the lines of if, if the state can decide on matters of marriage and prosecute adultery, yes. then why can the state not decide on matters of heresy? Yeah. And it was a small step because they had already accepted. And, and, and of course the, the, the reason uh, I mean, I'm not sure I agree, would agree with either of his premises, but uh, obviously the reason uh, the state might be able to handle uh, civil marriage contracts and such like that, but not handle religious matters, is because the religious matters are actually ev even further beyond the state reach. It's more precious. that We need to keep the state out of that. You know, Augustine, when Theodosius came to power and actually made not just Christianity a tolerated religion, but actually made it the state religion, Augustine really did think this was the com this was the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, they entered into a certain degree, almost of uh, secessionism, not a hundred percent so. But it was at least the beginning of it because he ascribed this, what he called the sensible miracles. Uh, for instance, someone who had their hands laid on them and they would begin to speak with tongues. He said, yes, that's in the Bible, but that was a miracle suited to the times of an immature church. These, what he called sensible miracles, healings, things like that. They were adapted to the times of an immature church, in his view. The reason it was an immature church was because it had not yet gained a Christian emperor. Mm. What made the church complete as the kingdom of God on earth... In Augustine's view. In Augustine's view, was the bringing of civil authority into conformity to the kingdom of God. <laughs> a little bit and, ironic. <laughs> yes, and, and uh, he, uh, he was blinded by it. Now, when uh, in 410, when Alaric sacked Rome, it was kind of a sobering thought to, uh, to Augustine because he had assumed Rome was uh, the kingdom of God. And so he had to readjust his view. And so in his latter days, he allowed that the pure kingdom was going to be in heaven, the city of God. And we're still going to have princes down here defending the faith, but uh, we're going to be an impure kingdom down here subject to the vicissitudes of wars. And so his celebrated ideal of the kingdom was Theodosius. Yes. But then when Rome was sacked, he rationalized that and adapted Yes. to a modified version yes. of Two Kingdoms. It was a more mature version of <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting that he's the first who's, who's formulating this doctrine that the gifts have ceased. And for him, the mature church is uh, evidenced by the appearance of an emperor and a civil authority. Today they say it's the appearance of the, of the canon of Scripture. But it's the same sort of dynamic that we don't need 
uh, an experience of the numinous God in the spirit because we we have him in safe boxes whether those be the imperial um, civil authority or they be our theologies yes. um, and I think that that takes me to one of the the interesting things that we've kind of highlighted Absolutely. thus far and we've identified four markers of of the restoration movement <clears throat> we're gonna kinda skip from the season of Constantine and Augustine in the three and four hundreds and we're gonna fast forward to the 1170s <laughs> and that's really the first time we see that the trend downward that was happening in the church starts to reverse and the restoration really begins with Peter Waldo and I know people dispute that but I think that's that's arguably the best um, the clearest marker of the turning point a tide turning where even if it was a small number people started moving in the other direction of restoration going back to the to the Christianity of, of, of the Bible and the four themes of restoration that we've identified are, are one the supremacy of the Bible the Word mm -hmm. of God and two a personal experience of God and repentance as opposed to speculation and theory and with that convictions as opposed to mere beliefs real convictions in the sense of something you're willing to die for and finally a willingness to progress an unwillingness to allow their faith to become stagnant so ongoing faith conviction personal experience and supremacy of the Word of God those four things yes. seem to be thematic of yeah. all of those who 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 died in faith Amen. who really are our heroes of faith Amen. for for these times we saw it over and over again as we we began to to look into into these different people John Huss you know uh, the Anabaptist brethren here all of them had they had to have had. I mean, and they and many of them. It's absolutely documented. They had a a a personal confrontation with the Spirit of God, and when that happened, and they saw the the so to speak the face of Jesus, the presence of Jesus there, it rearranged their world. All of a sudden, they couldn't fit Jesus that they had met with this whole Constantinian world, this, this, uh, this church that had gilded itself and, and had gained power and wealth, and it, it turned them on their heels. Amen. And it gave them a different type of conviction. It wasn't a conclusion. It was a spirit-derived conviction uh, many of them admitted they said we don't have all the truth we we're not there if you can show me I'm wrong I'll, I'll agree but that encounter put something inside of them that putting a putting them around a stake and lighting a fire around them throwing them in it the, nothing could reverse it it was the type of conviction I want to have in my life it's not going to be churned up through determination and will it's going to come from a brokenness before God a humility that opens us up to a supernatural grace amen. and that's what we saw and inspired us amen. in all of these people that we, we've been studying tomorrow we're traveling to Lyon to visit the, 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 the region where the Waldensian movement began and Peter Waldo it said had recently lost a dear friend uh, they had passed away and on one day he was in town or near town and he heard a traveling singer singing some hymn of Christian faith and in a moment of time the Holy Spirit just shattered through all the barriers and he was overcome to the point of weeping and went home and turned his entire life around it was exactly what you're describing. This was not an intellectual supposition. This was an encounter with the grace of God. And he hired two local monks to translate the Bible 
into a language he could understand. And that begins the Waldensian movement. This is Peter Waldo here. And the Waldensians persist under persecution, confiscation of property, and, and, and they really put forth the basics right there in the, the 1100s. They wanted the supremacy of Scripture. They, they talked about prayer and an experience with God's presence. They, they wanted to reject all extra-biblical tr uh, traditions like the Mass and transubstantiation, you know, the idea that, that Jesus was somehow physically being devoured in the, in the, the Lord's Supper. And this is the 1170s. Amen. And they were, they were a group that was allowed by God to persist in the hill country of southern France. Because they were not clergy, the Pope was not overly antagonistic toward them. In fact, he even promoted some of their beliefs. Um, he just forbade them to preach. And so they, they went about spreading their message in a, in a rather unconventional manner. What was so different about Jan Hus and some of these others is that they were ministers. They were, they were ordained ministers, priests. And, and so many would see what happened with the Waldensians as not yet the Reformation because it wasn't happening within the church system. But that's the point. God doesn't move through that system. He moves spontaneously <clears throat> through the hearts of people Amen. who will hear his voice. And Amen. So the next, the next figure that, that we want to focus on is, is Jan Hus. And he again was, he was a clergyman when he came to conversion, but he was raised in a, a completely impoverished peasant family. And it seems his father was likely killed when the boy was only 10 years old. At which point he was sent to study to become a priest. And he so impressed his teachers that they sent him to the University of Prague, where he excelled again and went through all kinds of education. And before he knew it, he was shown some of the works of John Wycliffe, who was considered a theorist. Again, he was not a minister. Wycliffe was not really in the ministry, and he wasn't pastoring a church. But here he's translating the Bible into English. God was using him. And many of much of what he was saying was, was truly inspired of the Lord. But he was able to open the door to Huss. And Huss, this man had something of substance. He's actually the first one, even though his followers did not adhere to this, right. he says the Pope and the Christian have no place in resorting to violence or taking up arms against anyone. Yeah that the Christian is supposed to show mercy and compassion and not justice to the sinner. Um, he, he was warned, he was threatened, but a lot of the, the, the common folk in Bohemia, modern-day Czechia, or what we've historically known as Czechoslovakia, they were very supportive of him. And um, things kind of deteriorated politically uh, one pope was favorable, the next one wasn't favorable. And then this strange <laughs> incident occurred where yeah. there were three popes all claiming to be the vicar of Christ. Yeah. And you've got Gregory and Alexander and whoever the other pope was. They're all fighting with each other. One's over in Lyon, one's in Rome, one's elsewhere. And um, so one of those popes is favorable, the other is not. And Who's going to pick whose side? And they didn't know who was going to win the battles. It was a, it was a confusing time, yeah. and that's what. So they called the, uh, the Council, Council of Constance. Uh, it was named, by the way, after Constantius, uh, Constantine's father. That's um, right over here in Germany. Yes, we drove there yesterday. Yes, and uh, the the reason for the conference was to settle this problem with three popes. I thought that would be a sign of the Trinity myself, <laughs> there were three popes. But, but uh, uh, oh, uh, we, uh, they, they uh, determined also that they needed to deal with, uh, with us. And Sigismund gave him uh, safe conduct, safe, safe passage. And he was, a, Sigismund was the king of the Romans. Yes. What would later be called Holy the Roman Holy Emperor. Roman Emperor. Yes. And, uh, so, uh, but people warned him and it sure seems as if Huss knew what he was doing because he made out his last will and testament before he went. And when the Pope had put him under um, a papal bull, 
while he still lived in Prague, in order to relieve the city of the oppression that that was causing in terms of trade, because it meant the entire community was going to be excommunicated until they excommunicated him. Right. He exiled himself, That's true. and he went to the country, yes. and he found a lot of common ground and a lot of understanding among people who were not urbanized in their thinking. Amen. And that's where he met Peter Helchitsky, yes. who, we're, who we'll talk about in a minute here. Yeah. But uh, so, so he's coming back from the country. He, he, had, he had been safe in exile in the country, yet when they offered for him to come to the Council of Constance and they guaranteed him safe passage, he took the risk and went. But to yes. your point, before leaving his home, he wrote out a full will and testament yes. indicating that he knew they were not to be trusted. Yeah. And many of his friends tried to dissuade him, just as Paul's friends tried to dissuade him from going to Rome. They said, uh, don't do it, it's a trap. And it was, it was a trap. Um, when he did come there, I think uh, they made one of his chief opponents, his defense attorney. No, I think that's, isn't that, that's, um, that's uh, Michael Sattler. Okay. They deprived that's right. him. That's right, Michael Sattler. You're they, absolutely great. They, they, they didn't give him, him any right. defense attorney. They put him in this tiny silo yes. of a tower for three. 70, how many? How, yeah, how over long? three months. Yeah, over three months. And they gave him bread and water, no warmth, no contact with friends. Yes no contact with family, uh, and then expected him to be able to mount his defense yes. against a whole panel of prosecutors that had been yes. preparing their case. Yes. And the the verdict was guilty. They, you know, when they first tried to, I love this quote, when, when they, they implored him before beginning the trial to recant, and he said, I would not for a chapel full of gold retreat from the truth. Amen. He had these pithy statements, and Amen. some of them were, were pretty pretty powerful. And didn't he also argue that, or, or at least tell them, that if you can just show me in the scripture, I'm he wrong. did, he did. He I, said, I, he said, I have no commitment except to the Word of God. Amen. And he had officially, when he was exiled from Prague, he had made an official appeal, as if to an emperor, but he wrote it to the Lord Jesus. Amen. And he said, I. I have lost my confidence in the faculty of the university, and I have lost my confidence in the bishop and the pope, and I have lost my confidence in all but the Lord Jesus, and so I make my appeal thus. Amen. And, you know, when they, <clears throat> when they asked him to recant at the trial, it was, a, it was a phony trial, and when they asked him to recant and he did not, they made him dress in all of his priestly garments and vestments and then they made they came to him and stripped those from his body and took the tonsor from his head and crushed it before him and they were expecting him to be utterly humiliated and shattered at, at the degradation he was undergoing yeah. instead we're told that he knelt and began to pray for them that God would not Amen that God would forgive them for what they were doing. He'd had an encounter with Jesus, yeah. and he acted just like his Lord. Yeah. You, know, you, can tell, you can tell the difference. Yeah. They led him out to, a, to the place of execution. We visited that. Right. And they, they placed a stump before him and put a collar of, of steel, of iron, around his neck and a chain to the stump so that he would be in this kneeling position. And it said, they said that before he died, he was preaching and encouraging people. And the name Hus yes. means goose. And he didn't lose his sense of humor because before he died, he said, they called it a prophecy. They said, he said, today you may roast an insignificant goose. But tomorrow God is going to raise up eagles and falcons whose message and work you will not stop. Amen. They lit the fires around him and they used wood that was not entirely dry 
and so he languished in, in agony under that insufficient flame on his body with only his head exposed on the stump. Finally, a peasant woman had compassion and brought a pile of dry brush and threw it on the fire. And he said, may God bless you for this simple and saintly deed. Amen. Luther would later say that Jan Hus prophesied his arrival from the stake. Yes. The, it seems like they fully expected that the work was going to be silenced and this was going to be the end of the Bohemian Reformation. On the contrary, his followers did not have his same convictions of nonviolence, but they were deeply enraged. They were scandalized by it. Yeah. Absolutely. And the Hussite Wars broke out, which was a, a, a very unfortunate thing. And this, unfor unfortunately, is um, something that reoccurs in history that certain people overreact. They, uh, they're baited by something and react in violence, which then just justifies the other side from cracking down on them. Um, but it was in the midst of the beginning of the Hussite Wars that uh, Peter started, Helsinki, yeah. started uh, saying we cannot use violence. Right. And he became an inspiration for all sorts of people Amen. that we know today. So we went and visited Peter Helchitsky as well. And he and Huss dialogued together uh, while Huss was living in the country. Yes. And he became part of the Bohemian Reformation. And scholars say that he was one of the most influential thinkers of that entire era. Yes. I had never heard of him until a few years ago. But he is the first man to really write extensively and formulate a biblically sound argument that Christians have to be nonviolent. Yes. He wasn't saying that the, the state needed to be pacifistic, but he, he was stressing that Christians Absolutely. needed to be nonviolent. He also believed that Christians needed to stay rooted on the land. Yes. And he's one of the only of these reformers that did not lose his life because he simply stayed away from the city. <laughs> and uh, Went to his farm. Yeah. And stayed on his farm for 40 years, I believe it was. Yes, sir. He's like an Anabaptist ahead of his time. Yes. So he's an interesting character, and, and uh, the only reason his work survived is because somebody took up his manuscripts, enormous volumes of, of handwritten manuscripts, and uh, spirited them away to Poland and saved them there in Poland. <laughs> and his, his the, I believe that... What is it, uh, Unitas Fratrum? Isn't that what they call it? The unity of the brethren? Yes. He was the, from what I understand, the most influential uh, yes. thinker behind that movement that then became the Moravians, yeah. who then uh, were instrumental in the conversion of John Wesley, yeah. who then was instrumental in the holiness movement which then led to the modern day 20th century Pentecostal movement. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. His, his influence, uh, Tolstoy, Gandhi, um, it was a powerful message. And again, the only explanation that I see for it, he encountered Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> he, and everything was turned upside down. Yeah. There was an actual experience Experience where the Spirit of God, he encountered the Spirit of God. Amen. That's a powerful thought, and especially when you think of that passage we've taught from before where he says, these all died in faith, not having received Amen. what was promised, so that we would, they would not be made perfect apart from us. Amen. And these men gave their lives, and so many of us have never even heard of them. Yeah. But if there had been no Peter Tchaikovsky, there would have been no... Moravians, no Wesley conversion, Amen. no Pentecostals, Amen. which is called the, the, the religion of the 20th century. Amen. So we skip across to, to uh, the Swiss Brethren. Of course, Luther comes on in the scene here, and he brings some, some incredible insights, and his yeah. beginning there is powerful. 
but he's he's very much of a magisterial reformer. You know, when Luther first encounters God, it's in a lightning storm, and he begins to pray that God will save him, and he feels that he encounters and meets the Lord. And and again, this is this is not intellectual. This is somebody meeting with the Lord, and he called himself a prophet. <laughs> he felt like God had had called him, and I don't dispute that. The sad thing is, is because he was not able to divorce, he was an Augustinian monk, yes. and because he was not able to divorce himself from Augustine's rationalization of the church's marriage with the state. Ultimately, his union with the princes clouded his vision. And in time, he was persecuting those who were determined to go further. Yes. And that's another theme that we saw is just how often it seems that those who start out well and go 50% toward restoration end up being the most vicious persecutors of those who want to go 100%. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Jumping over to the to Switzerland, you've got Ulrich Zwingli, and he is located here in Zurich, where we've been and where we are today. And he was a powerful man. He he was the son of a mayor, and so his thinking was always politically inclined, as some of the scholars we spent time with yesterday told yes. us. He was always a politician and then a theologian, not vice versa. So, but he he has some kind of stirring in his life, and he begins to preach from the Bible. He translates the Bible ahead of Luther into German um, in 31, 1531, I believe. We got, to, we got to see that Bible. Yes. That Do we have pictures of that? That's okay. We'll, we we'll show you <laughs> in coming pictures. We got to see that original color Bible. And how perfectly preserved those images still are after all these years, after nearly 500 years. But in the 1520s, he is preaching, Zwingli is preaching, and it's so powerful that a student named Conrad Grable, when he, he has studied humanism in Basel and in uh, Vienna and in Paris, he's friends with some of the most renowned humanists at the time, Conrad Grable, he's the son of a, of a city councilman. When he comes back to Zurich as a troublemaker, a humanist, and a rabble-rouser, he hears the preaching of Ulrich Zwingli. Yes. At times they said the crowds were so great that they couldn't accommodate them in the Bruceminster church, and so it would spill out into the marketplace. Well, again, Grable has a conversion experience. Again, this is an experience. This is not a conclusion. It's an experience. It's an encounter with God. And he goes, in one day, God turns his life around. He encounters the grace of God, and he goes from being a troublemaker to being a devout scholar of the Scripture. Felix Mons and his friends, I mean, Conrad Grable and his friends, Felix Mons and George Blarock, become some of Zwingli's most ardent students and supporters. They're indistinguishable. What Zwingli is preaching is being uh, propagated by these students. And they, they are more than students. They become leaders in the movement. And they would have been preaching from the, uh, the pulpit right there in Grusminster. And yet, when Zwingli faces his first confrontation with the council, um, they, they oblige him. They allow him to do it. When he faces his second disputation with the council, they don't want to change infant baptism. Infant baptism is something that Zwingli was the first one to, our, to, to reject. He articulated believer's baptism first, and he taught it to these students. But when the students see him back down in the face of a threat from the state, they lose all confidence in him. Amen. And you, know, you, would, you would think baptism or, or or they also argued over communion you would think these things shouldn't be all that important but uh it had everything to do with whether the the church would be a church state a constantinian church 
or whether it would be a believer's church. Amen. Because uh, infant baptism, the reason the city council wanted to insist upon it, and as had all those in the realm of the Holy Roman Empire, is that baptized the person not only into the church, but into citizenship. Hmm. It was a mark of, of being under the imperial uh, realm. And, and uh, these people began, Barak and Mans and, and Grable, began to see a believer's church, which we take for granted today. I, almost all evangelicals, even the Catholics believe now in a believer's church. But back then, the blinders were on. Everyone that we met with said that. The defenders of Zwingli exactly. would all say he could not think out of the box. And to have a parallel society, people yeah. baptizing outside of the, the, the rubric of the state was something that just could not be comprehended. Mm. And so they they took action. He he first debated his own students in front of the council and by all accounts they trounced him and and that's why they backed down from their threat to burn whoever <laughs> lost the debate. They just kinda went hush hush about it. But they declared Zwingli the victor, a declaration they had made before the debate. But um, they ordered that all children be baptized within eight days of the ruling or their parents would face banishment or worse. And they refused to do it. And uh, on January 21st, 1525, um, they were gathered at the house of Felix's mother. And they had there were about 15 of them that had been seeking the Lord. And finally... George Blarock, who was the oldest among them at uh, only the age of 30, he, he said, I've, I've come to a faith in Jesus, and I know I have not been baptized, but I need to be. And he asked them to baptize him. And I believe they baptized him in Felix's bathtub, which is interesting. And then he turned and baptized all of the rest that very hour. And that was the name Anabaptist, meaning rebaptized. And that was the birth of the believers church in a sense the baptists the mennonites the brethren so many of the free church of the congregational church they owe their foundation they owe, they owe their their origins their yes. roots to these men and these choices that were made yes of course um just two years later on january 5th 1527 um the council ruled that felix mons should be put to death because he would not recant. And this was this was a Protestant reformed council that's ruling this. And Zwingli sided with the council. And despite what anybody would say, he, he declared in writing, he said, Felix has brought this on himself. Now he will become the punishment he deserves. He was angry with him for not recanting. It never it never rattled him that he was about to murder one of his own students in the name of Christ. So on that on that cold January afternoon, they took Felix down to the Lamont River, right there uh, below Grusminster Church, and took him out on a fishing platform and, and uh, bound his hands to his legs and put a broomstick in between and held him underwater until he drowned. Amen. And... Uh, what was interesting is they expected that, that this was going to really turn the tide again, and it didn't. Amen. People were hungry to see a, a faith in God that was real and that was stronger than the power of death. And we're told that Felix's mother cried out from the crowd to her son while he was being led to the, to the execution, Be faithful unto death, Amen. Felix. And he, he prayed and delivered his spirit into the hands of God. And he was the first Anabaptist martyr. But really, he was, really, he was continuing the same theme as, as Jan Hus. Yes. If Hus had, had, had made it, there would have been a continuity. Because really and truthfully, there was a continuity. Yeah. They both eschewed violence. They both were 
were um, really espousing much of the same things. You know, Zwingli had divided devotion. And I think uh, because there was a time, what would it have been, four years earlier, right. he was supportive of these people. Oh, yeah. But something came into conflict with Swingley's vision because he was not wholly dedicated to the building of the church, but building what he viewed as the kingdom of God, which was both the civil order. He dreamed of a Protestant kingdom, just like the Holy Roman Empire. He dreamed of a Protestant kingdom all the way, it said, from the Baltic to the Adriatic. He made league with Philip of Hesse. And so these, these uh, rebaptizers weren't just threatening some doctrine of his church. They were threatening his dream of a Protestant empire. And uh, he, just four years after he uh, killed someone, uh, sanctioned the killing of someone who had a conviction from God that went to his death as a lamb. Uh, Swingley, who had been backed down by the council earlier on when he was on their side and wanted it and saying hey it's all right to baptize adults yeah. and such he didn't have the courage to stand up to the civil magistrates then but four years after he sanctioned the death of felix mons he feels threatened by the the, the catholic cantons of uh of the swiss confederation and he goes to war and he's killed on the battlefield he was willing to give his life in some heroic bravado uh, to defend a uh, civil kingdom, but he wasn't willing, he didn't have the grace to give his life. And, and unfortunately, you know, the day after Blaurock and Grable and Mans and the others there in Felix's mother's house were baptized, the very next day, in Zolikon, just a few miles south of there, uh, and Blairock and Grable and Mans went there and everything. Uh, I believe at least 40 were baptized the next day. Uh, then people started coming from the countryside, and hundreds of people were rebaptized. And in that center in, in Zolikon, they say that that, because they had everything. They understood that the church should be separated from the civil powers. They understood it was supposed to be a believer's church. They understood that it was to be a communion of believers. So historians say that in this congregation was the very first consciously convened believer's church in probably 1,200 years that we know of. And yet, the, and boy, Zwingli came after him. And they immediately started persecuting this, this small congregation. And I'm going to say that perhaps they hadn't fully counted the cost yet or something because they began, this particular congregation began to waver and they decided to make a compromise. And they, they uh, accepted uh, the offer from Swingley and the council that if they would cease rebaptizing people and leave all the preaching up to the official uh, state preachers, then they could just live their lives the way they wanted to, and they accepted the compromise. They backed down, and in eight months that congregation was gone, and then four years after that, three of their leaders were with Zwingli on the battlefield and were killed. Um, but again, again, they were unwilling to face death for their convictions. Yes. But they ended up dying for the state. Yes. Meaninglessly. Yes. But there were others that uh, they were determined to take it all the way. It it th this, it was called the fire in the Zurich Hills. Yes. I mean, it moved so fast. There were thousands in a matter of just a few years. Yes. Yes. Something else. We.
we got to bring in uh, Michael Sattler. That's what here. I was just getting ready to go to. Yeah. What he, a story. He would have been, he, he was likely, Michael Sattler was a priest uh, and a, the head of a, of a uh, uh, monastery. He was made a prior. He was a very educated man. Again, he said that he lived an undisciplined, ungodly, unholy life until he met the Lord Amen. in a powerful prayer. And so he also was, he was there on the day of, uh, of um, Felix's yeah. drowning. And he was likely banished from Zurich. He was banished from Zurich, but it was likely at the same time with Blarock. Yeah. And he went about preaching and writing, and he authored the Schleitheim Confession, Amen. which uh, they adopted as the first unified statement of faith of this new band of Amen. believers. Could I emphasize something here? And all uh, we we've mentioned it, but all of these people also really began the 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 Word of God in the sense of the Bible was rediscovered by them. It's almost like uh, when Josiah. they found the Bible in Josiah's time. Yeah. That had a profound influence uh, all the way from Wycliffe on bringing the Bible into the common languages had a profound effect on, on people. And these people all had encountered the scripture also and were weighing their convictions. It wasn't just wildfire. No. They were weighing the convictions against the word as they felt that anointing leading them to, to, to read it. Amen. You know? So he, he's put on trial. He's arrested and taken to Rottenburg, which is... Catholic, still Catholic at that time, and he's put on trial. Um, seems like the Austrian prince who was there upon his arrest wanted to kill him immediately. Yes. But the other goon said, yeah, by by what the I think it was Ferdinand said by a third baptism. Yeah. Drowning. But the other guy wanted to give him due, the appearance of due process. So they so they provided his one of his arch enemies as his defense attorney. Yes, yeah. exactly. Due process. After they had berated him and challenged him and accused him of nine points and he had answered, the trial was coming to a close and he, he concluded his response. I might just read some of this trial. Absolutely. It's... This is it's, Michael Sattler. It's recorded by a contemporary witness to the trial. Right. And Michael Sattler is said to be right up there with Conrad Grable and Felix Mons as one of the most influential leaders of the Swiss Brethren Anabaptist movement. He was put to death the same year as Mons. This yes. is 27. Whereas he says in response at his trial, we have not acted contrary to God and the gospel. You will find that neither I nor my brethren and sisters have offended in word or deed against any authority. Therefore, you ministers of God, if you have not heard or read the word of God, send for the most learned and for the sacred books of the Bible of whatsoever language they may be and let them confer with us in the word of God. And if they prove to us with the Holy Scriptures that we err and are in the wrong, we will gladly desist and recant and also willingly suffer the sentence and punishment for that of which we have been accused. Amen. But if no error is proven to us, I hope to God that you will be converted and receive instruction. Upon this speech, the judges laughed and put their heads together, and the town clerk of Eisenheim said, O oh, you infamous, desperate villain and monk, shall we dispute with you? The hangman shall dispute with you, I assure you. Michael said, God's will be done. The town clerk said, If it were well, if you it were well if you had never been born. Michael replied, God knows what is good. The town clerk said, You arch heretic you have seduced the pious. If they would only now forsake their error and accept grace. Michael said, grace is with God alone. One of the prisoners also said, we must not depart from the truth. 
The town clerk said, You desperate villain and arch heretic, I tell you, if there were no hangmen, I would hang you myself and thus serve God. Michael replied, God will judge aright. Thereupon the town clerk said words to him in Latin, what we do not know. Michael answered, Judica, which means judge. He said something about God will judge. The town clerk then admonished the judges and said, He will not cease from his talk today. Therefore, my lord judge, proceed with the sentence. I will commit it to the law. The judge asked Michael Sattler whether he also was committed to the law. Sattler replied, You ministers of God, I am not sent to judge the word of God. We are sent to bear witness of it, and hence cannot consent to any law, since we have no command from God concerning it. But if we can be discharged from the law, we are ready to suffer. If we cannot be discharged from the law, we are ready to suffer for the word of God, whatever sufferings are or may be imposed upon us, all for the sake of the faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. As long as we have breath within us, unless we be dissuaded from it by the Scriptures. Amen. The town clerk said, The hangman shall convince you. He shall dispute with you, you arch heretic. Michael said, I appeal to the Scriptures. Then the judges arose and went into their room, where they remained for an hour and a half and determined on the sentence. In the meantime, some in the room treated Michael Sattler most unmercifully, heaping reproach upon him. One of them said, What have you in expectation for yourself and the others that you have so seduced them? With this he also drew forth a sword, which he lay upon the table, saying, See this? this with this they shall dispute with thee. But Michael did not answer upon a single word concerning his person, but willingly endured it. One of, the, one of the prisoners said, We must not cast pearls before swine. Being also asked why he had not remained a lord at the convent, Michael answered, According to the flesh, I was a lord, but it is better so. He did not say more than, is re, he did not say more than what was recorded here, and this he spoke fearlessly. The judges, having returned to the room, read the sentence as follows. Mm -hmm. In the case of the governor of his imperial majesty versus Michael Sattler, judgment is passed. Michael Sattler shall be delivered to the executioner, who shall lead him to the place of execution and cut out his tongue. Then throw him upon a wagon, and there tear his body twice with red-hot tongs. And after he has been brought without the gate, he shall be pinched five times, in the same manner. After this had been done in the manner prescribed, he was burned to ashes as a heretic. His fellow brethren were executed with the sword, and the sisters were drowned. His wife also, after being subjected to many entreaties, admonishments, and threats, under which she remained very steadfast, was drowned a few days afterwards. This was done on May 21st, 1527. Amen. You know, you you hear that judgment that was actually carried out that way. They cut his tongue out. They ripped at his body with red hot tongs. That I think we added all up 14 times. It's demonic. What was going on that so upset the devil? that he could instill such viciousness in people. I think it's the devil knew that he had the church wrapped up in this Constantinian, in these Constantinian walls. And there was no real danger of his uh, to his kingdom. You know, but he saw in these people who had encountered the risen Lord who were 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 delving into to the written word that were that were wanting to restore a church that had a genuine relationship with God. He, Satan felt his kingdom beginning to shake, Amen. and he hit back with it with all that he had. Amen. You know, 
Christian philosophy is no threat to the power of the evil one. But that kind of conviction yeah. and that kind of encounter with God is. And to this day, that's, that's what's going to bring down evil in our world, in our lives. It's not the power of brute force that Zwingli died for. It's the power of triumphant love that Sattler and Felix died for. And the persecutions continued for the next 200 years. They, they butchered the Anabaptist. Read the Martyr's Mirror. Yeah. And, and like you've pointed out, it wasn't just the Catholics doing it. Everybody wants to. The Protestants were doing the same thing. Uh, it, it was it, one of the, or maybe even a couple of the scholars that we talked to noted, Peter Detweiler, he noted that not only did Zurich exile all the Anabaptists from the geographical location, he said, we exiled them from our minds. Nobody even knew that it had happened. And uh, I believe that, that, that he said, up through most of the 20th century, we're talking almost 500 years, no Anabaptist congregation would be allowed in Zurich. There was a reaction against these people, yeah. but it became, I believe one person called it the, the hidden seed. Hmm. <laughs> the devil couldn't, couldn't, couldn't stomp it out. It spread, and I'll tell you, when we see these people and read their stories, it puts such an obligation upon us to finish their course. They didn't have the liberty to fulfill and go further because their lives were snuffed out. Amen. But uh, we not only have the liberty, we have the obligation to have that kind of conviction to go all the way. Amen. And they can be made perfect. Their work can be completed Absolutely. with us. Amen. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to text. That's 661-212-5415. Um, we're not going to be on for much longer, but if you'll send in some texts, send in some questions, we'd be happy to answer. Do we have any questions as it is? Not at the moment. No questions at the moment. So okay. that's 661-212-5415. So tell a little bit about some of the some of the movements that sprang from the Anabaptist work and how, it, how that kind of spread and multiplied. Amen. Of course... Uh, the most, I guess, the most well-known movement would be the Mennonites, but uh, when they got settled in the Netherlands, there was this little-known, uh, uh, what do they call them, nonconformist group in England that got started, and uh, led by a man named John Smith, uh, who decided to then, uh, he may not have decided willingly. I think he might have been tossed out of England. But uh, he went over and became a Waterlander Mennonite. And that's the beginning of the Baptist movement. John Smith is considered the first Baptist. The first Baptist. And, in uh, Europe and Roger Williams in America. In America. And, and Roger Williams, uh, he had a lot of these same convictions. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. Was, a, he was a special person. And he's borrowing and building on the separation of church and state. Absolutely. The Anabaptists are the first to give us what would later be enshrined in the Constitution of separation of church and state. Amen. They were trying to uncouple the Constantinian marriage. They were trying to take the church out of the state and the state out of the church. Amen. And these things that so many people take for granted today in the church, it was, uh, it was fought with blood. Uh, and bought with blood uh, 500, almost exactly 500 years ago is when it started. But from them also, like we, we've mentioned, I mean, there's the Baptists, then uh, the, the, the Unitas Fratrum, the, the Unity of the Brethren that became the Moravians. Mm -hmm. They started the missionary movement. Right. Uh, every, you, you would think, I mean, there hadn't been missionaries, I think, way back in the early part there were missionaries sent out into Europe to tame the the barbarians the Celts and, and such but uh, they started the modern-day missionary movement 
And uh, of course they, like we mentioned, they uh, really were very instrumental in uh, John Wesley's conversion. The Moravians. The Moravians okay. from a, uh, 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 being Anglican. a good Anglican. Uh, you know, the Anglican Church was, I'll tell you, it, it's, you know, bless them, there's a lot of Anglicans today that are taking a stand for the Word of God. But uh, it, it was a magisterial uh, uh, reformation that took place there, really, because King Henry had trouble getting a wife that would give him an heir, and he wanted to keep divorcing his wives. Or and, killing them. Or killing them, you know, whatever, we got to get rid of them. But, but the, the Moravians, uh, then we have John Wesley. Uh, Wesley really, um, the, the whole notion of living a holy, godly life, which you would think, now these, these people, they had it, but it was largely lost to the church at large. But let Wesley reintroduce that, the holiness movement that uh, sprung in the early part of the 20th century to uh, 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 the Pentecostal movement. Uh, the, the Mennonites had spread into, uh, into uh, Russia under Catherine the Great uh, because she needed some good farmers and they were good farmers and she promised that they wouldn't be uh, 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 drafted into the military. They found a safe haven. Well there, revival started breaking out. People started receiving the Holy Spirit back in the 1830s, 1840s in Russia. And this movement uh, called the Moluccans started, who uh, then moved across the Caucasus Mountains. And they were called Moluccans. Because they, they wouldn't drink, uh, the, they the Russian Orthodox Church uh, had fast days that uh, where you weren't supposed to drink milk. They had 240 of these out of the year. Every day was a fast day. Well, the Moluccans would drink milk on those days because they didn't believe in the state church. They had become a, a believer's church and filled with the Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues. And this was in the 1840s, 1850s. And so they were called Moluccans because that's Russian for milk drinkers. Uh, <laughs> But they they converted uh, the uh, uh, many of the the uh, Armenians, who uh, and a prophecy came forth from Efim Klubnikin back in 1853. You can read about it. It's quite a story, uh, but it prophesied that the Armenians were going to have to leave Armenia. Uh, they did leave Armenia uh, in uh, by 1905. The spirit-filled ones that were obedient left and that was when the Turks moved in right after that and committed the first genocide of the 20th century. But God had forewarned his people but this group then went and they happened, they, they traveled halfway around the world because of this prophecy, landed in Southern California and showed up at this place called Azusa Street. <laughs> what a coincidence. What a coincidence. And uh, it's spread everywhere. The, 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 the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs, you know. And, uh, but it's conviction, it's a willingness to submit themselves to the, to the Word of God, to, to, to love one another, to form the body of Christ. That's what's behind every bit of it. And you know, uh, all these Reformed scholars that we talked to, they all admitted the Reformed Church is dead. Yeah. It has collapsed in Europe, and yet every place where there's true revival, mm -hmm. it's because people connect to the same encounter with Jesus, receiving that spirit, having that conviction amen. that's still alive amen amen well unless there are any questions 661-212-5415 we might sign off sooner than later i can't believe nobody wants to ask for the hour to question <laughs> we don't have him on all the time so this is a good time to ask um any questions okay yeah. well maybe this means we weren't even on air this whole time <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. We well, were just so erudite that that's we answered it. all the questions. That's it. <laughs> We'd like to think. Well, God bless you all. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. I guess I'm going to be in India next week, so maybe I don't know what our plan is, but we'll figure it out as we get there. Amen. All right. Good, good night from here. Good afternoon where you are, or good morning, or whatever it is. God be with you.